But let me just introduce our special guest today, um, Father Theodore Kufos. Um, he was born in Boston in 1940, and he attended seminary at Holy Trinity Orthodox Monastery in Jordanville, where he also studied iconography with the eminent masters Archimandrite Kiprian and Archbishop Alipi. He received his BA and MFA degree from the State University of New York at Buffalo, and then received a teaching assistantship at the State University of South Florida in Tampa, graduating with a master's degree in fine art. Father Theodore taught after that at local college for three years and was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 1974. Father Theodore was transferred to, a Tor to Toronto, Ontario, to a church here, and continued to paint many churches, uh, too numerous to list, under many jurisdictions. Father Theodore has taught Byzantine art and architecture at the Toronto Greek Orthodox Seminary and has been a guest lecturer and guide at the Royal Ontario Museum on numerous occasions, as well as a guest lecturer at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies at St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, as well as St. Paul University in Ottawa. So he is a renowned international iconographer, and he's noted for his strict adherence to authentic Byzantine iconographic tradition, both in Greco and Slavic Byzantine styles. This is one of the unique things about him. He can kind of bridge uh, both of those worlds and kind of work within a whole lot of different styles. We may want to ask him about something like that. He's received the patronage of many hierarchs, many churches, and his works are in the private collections of many of them, in the least not being the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. So we welcome with great love and with our, our honor uh, here today, Father Theodore, Father Ted, thank you for joining uh, with us today. And uh, it's really just an opportunity for us now to uh, ask any questions. Um, you should see, I think I'm sharing the um, from his website, the, we can look through some of the uh, images of some of the murals that he has painted. Um, and we can ask about those or ask really anything about his work and his life. Um, and the, as I was saying to Louise earlier, and we were talking about this with Father Ted, this could set us up for future encounters as well. So we don't have to get every question off of our, of our minds today. It's a kind of uh, beginning of a relationship, hopefully, where we can continue to learn uh, from him. So again, welcome Father Ted, and I will turn it over now to anyone who has any questions. Feel free to type it in the chat box and I will pass that on or just simply unmute yourself and ask a question. There are too many questions probably. Who, where do we start, right? <laughs> we have amongst us people who are um, uh, professors of art history, also uh, amateur iconographer, I think I could say, Andrew, is that right? I mean, you've sold a few, I suppose that makes you a professional, but uh, <laughs> you <Yeah>. dabble. <laughs> well, I'm the professor of, of art history, so I guess <laughs> I will ask my question, Father Theodore. Um, this was, this was a wonderful uh, video and a, a beautiful introduction to your work. Um, and I was, um, I was curious about, because actually my specialty is architecture, um, about the relationship between painting and, and architecture. In, in the modern world, in the modern West, we, we typically think of a painting as just a kind of standalone object. And often icons are standalone objects, but many of the most beautiful icons are actually integrated into, into a, the iconographic program of a building, of a church. And, um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the experience of um, of, of painting icons um, on the on the walls of a church and how you conceptualize that, how you design the the layout of icons and and the kind of interaction between the architecture of the building and the images. Much of iconography is prescribed, and the prescription is to make sure that. What you see is what the church believes. That's true even for architecture. In the East Roman Empire, architecture developed along with iconography. In the West, which was softly iconoclastic and showed it by not showing up for the Seventh Council, which uh, uh, reestablished icons 
in the churches in the East Roman Empire. But the correct dogmatic beliefs of the church was in the most important element for the church in the East and the West. The West did it by teaching in Latin. The East did it by teaching not only in Greek, but by producing architectural and visual stimulus that grandize the teaching of the Mother Church. When one walked into a church and heard Latin, they knew they were in a Catholic church. But in the Eastern Roman Empire, the Orthodox Church made its presence known by its iconography. And they developed together. This is a problem in today's world where churches are built and iconographers are told to fix the areas that don't work <laughs> and it's bad because much is missed. There are people that are now building churches in the more traditional style. The Russian Orthodox Church is adamant, especially building churches outside of Russia in the pure Byzantine, Russo Byzantine style. That's starting to happen in the West among Greek or Balkan Orthodox people. Unfortunately, in the Western Church, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, it's very expensive to, to build in a tradition of style. The Anglicans used to do it in North America by hiring a professional who understood the style that was sought after, which was usually English Gothic or Romanesque style. If you're ever in Boston, go to Copley Square and you'll see the Church of the Holy Trinity, an Anglican church built in the turn of the century that's just absolutely perfect in its concept, in its beauty. And there are Gothic churches in the English style that are very beautiful. And with the Oxford movement in the West, there was a return to ritual. This is true here in Toronto, in fact, St. James Cathedral. It costs money to do things right. And sometimes you can't do everything, but you can do as much as you can once a person understands where beauty is. Mm -hmm. Here is to merge beauty with belief, and that can be done through study, through knowledge. Can I ask, I mean, you, you mentioned the situation where the, um, the iconographer is kind of called in and, and you know, to a, work on a building that is, has flaws architecturally, and the um, sort of expectation is that you can, you can fix it or you can, you can um, somehow mitigate them uh, through the iconography. But I'm curious if the, if the reverse ever happens, that you are able to find kind of fortuitous opportunities in, in a specific building for the, the architecture and the, and the iconography to complement one another or to, to bring out some architectural feature of the building or for the architecture to bring out some aspect of the iconography that might be you know, specific to a particular church building? Well, Joseph, it's not easy to correct these blatant architectural mistakes. And, and they exist more often than not. To be pure in rendition isn't so easy. And it's not always sought after. But there are architects that, can, that have a, a desire to do it and have built some wonderful things. I know uh, when I was at Sara Church in a particular city that I was told to paint once. And I said, well, how can you paint where there's uh, pipes and uh, air conditioning units and 
all sorts of stuff right in the middle of the wall where you would have a painting. And sometimes the shape of the wall is not conducive to allow you to paint the side that should be rendered. And one bishop once said to me, you're right, we'll fix it. Well, you, you, you can't give what you ain't got. Traditionally, and it makes sense that the architects worked with the painters together and they produce magnificent masterpieces. They're all over the world. When you combine them, then you achieve success. And there's a way of doing it so that you can become economical by maybe cutting away from details, which costs lots of money, and yet still to produce something that's worth seeing. Simply by concerning yourself with basics, simplicity can show the beauty of masterpieces, and we can learn from them. Sometimes architects want to be original. And originality is not something that I believe should be sought. It's something that comes by itself. And when it does, it's real. There's some arch architectural feats that I wonder, uh, for instance, an example that I, I'm not calling down, but the Church of the Holy Family in Spain Gaudi, who did something with Gothic art that I think didn't need to be done. But even Gothic, basic Gothic design can be made contemporary. And this is true with Byzantine, and this is true with all sorts of style, by simply concerning oneself with the basic simplicity of lines. But it's important to have both. Well, I hope I uh, answered some question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Father. Father, there's a question that's been put into the chat here about, could you explain the mandorla that uh, Christ is seen in, in several icons, uh, particularly festal ones? The image made without hands is uh, from, not from scripture, uh, from the four Gospels, but comes from tradition that the king of Armenia was very ill and heard about the miracles of Christ and asked to receive him. And according to tradition, St. Jude, the apostle, was asked to take a piece of cloth that had imprinted on it the image of Christ by him wiping his face with the cloth. And the cloth was taken to King Agbar, I believe, if I am correct with the name, and uh, wiped his face and was cured of his leprosy. That's the, it's called the image made without hands because it wasn't painted. And it existed and it was put, according to history, on the gate to Constantinople and was lost during one of the uh, wars between, I believe, Persia and uh, the Greco-Roman nation. Uh, I think the question was actually about Mandorla, you know, the, the shape that is behind Christ. I've got the icon up here of the resurrection, for example, where... Oh, you know, wow. I'm sorry. Yeah. But I mean, that was a wonderful answer about the Mandelian. <laughs> well, I saw it on... on I, I, they were talking about the Mandelian. Yes, well, that we had that up earlier on one of the things. So maybe the person was asking about that. I'm not sure, but it is actually written Mandorla. So I'm now showing the Christ with the Mandorla behind him, like like in Transfiguration icon, the Resurrection one. Yeah, that that that's to to, to emphasize the importance of that figure visually. Sometimes it's done in gold but it's always around Christ. And this is the raise the Christ, when he was killed, his spirit went to Hades and took Adam and Eve and all the righteous to heaven. And the mandola can be used 
and often is around any icon of the Virgin Mary or Christ, but to emphasize the spirituality and importance of the figure you're looking at. This is known as the icon of the resurrection. I think it's more of an Eastern element. Uh, did I answer the question? I think that that probably answered it. Are there any other questions or comments that people want to make? You've been seeing some of the, the images that go by here. Andrew, you have one? Yes. Uh, do you, Father, uh, still do icons slash take people under your wing to teach them to do iconography? Yes, I do. Uh, how can I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> Get my telephone number. Okay. I will get that from Louise then. <laughs> What's your name? Andrew. Andrew, where are you from? Uh, Mississauga. Originally? Egypt. Zayek. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> now ask me how I am. Zayek. Ya Rabbi Daiman. There you go. <laughs> I've got a lot of uh, friends from Egypt. Uh -huh. The Egyptian church is very interesting. They're good people. Most people are good. Father, I have a question. The, um, what are the crosses on the Virgin, on the Theotokos? You know, the stars? On her shoulders? On her shoulders. What is, it, what is the meaning of the stars in, on the shoulders? In Byzantine iconography, the mother of God who was clothed always in a royal color, blue or red, as Christ wears the same colors on his philosophical toga, because philosophers deal with truth. And you'll see that it would be a depiction of some prophets and even apostles. But the mother of God, whose head is always covered, although in real life, that's historically incorrect, but history plays a second role to dogma, to belief, to truth, and her head is covered because she remained a virgin even after the incarnation. There's a star on her head and on each shoulder to show the church's belief that she maintained her virginity before, during, and after, after she gave birth to Christ and the rest of her life. Those three elements of time she maintained her virginity. The church has always believed this. And of course, it allows you, when looking at a, a mural, a fresco, uh, to, to see which one is the mother of God. She always is adorned with the three stars. That's, icons are meant to be read and to look at, to be looked at, but to be read. These are theological issues that are very important, sometimes more important than historical truth, because she didn't wear them, they didn't actually wear them. The church bestows that upon her. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Father, we don't want to tire you out too much in this first go, but I think we've set ourselves up for uh, maybe doing this again sometime and hearing more stories. Um, you know, particularly about how you were formed at the kind of feet of great masters and how you've also integrated, um, you know, a, a Western or, you know, kind of academic art formation alongside, you know, the, the kind of spiritual Byzantine iconographic tradition and everything. So I, I really enjoyed hearing about that myself. So I think maybe that will give us something to talk about next time. Um, but uh, thank you very much for your time today. It's been uh, marvelous and uh, we've recorded this so those who weren't able to be with us can hear a little bit too about, uh, about what you've said. So I, I really appreciate it. I re especially liked the, the comments on architecture and the integration of, of uh, iconography into that. So there's much more we can tap in you, I'm sure, as a, as a resource and uh, a spiritual guide into this way of seeing. Because, um, I mean, as that video so, so eloquently put it, I know it wasn't a kind of perfect introduction to icons, you know, as a whole thing, but it, it really did emphasize that theme of, you know, we, we need to learn to see.
right? You know, we, we don't go through life uh, naturally seeing everything the way it is. And as you've just emphasized, to kind of look deeply into things and, and see the true dogma, the truth at the heart of things is, is a skill, something we need to practice. So uh, we are happy to be guided by you as, as we encounter you. Uh, at another time. So thanks for your time today. Thank you all for, for joining uh, with us and um, we'll, we'll do this again. Thank you, Father. Wonderful to be with people who have the same interest you do. Marvelous. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you as well.